Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, on behalf of the Russell Sage Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and Duke University, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science. And hello again to everyone tuning in on the live stream. So today, we're going to talk about uh, mass collaboration. So uh, we'll have a lecture and discussion about mass collaboration, then a break, and then you all will get to participate in a mass collaboration uh, called the Fragile Families Challenge. We'll have time for lunch. Then you will continue with the Fragile Families Challenge. We'll have a debrief, a break, and then uh, our visiting speaker will start at 4 o'clock, Sendhil Mullenathan. That is going to be a fantastic talk, so I hope you all are excited for that. OK, so based on the feedback that we've been receiving, I'm going to try to cut down on the lectures to leave more time for the activities so the days feel less compressed. Uh, most of what I want to say about mass collaboration, I've already said. I've written it down in bit by bit, and so uh, if there's stuff that you want to learn more about, I would recommend reading chapter five. Uh, so I want to use my time here to review some of what I think are the main points and uh, emphasize certain things that I think are sometimes uh, overlooked about mass collaboration. So I want to talk about how I see mass collaboration fitting into the overall way that uh, we do social research. So when I was working on bit by bit, it's sort of organized in these sequence of designs where the researcher plays a larger and larger role. So initially, there's observing behavior. This is what most big data sources are. In this case, the researcher has no interaction with the participants and plays no role in shaping the data that gets created. Then you can have a slightly more active design where you actually ask people questions. And there are certain things that you can learn by asking people questions that you can't learn just by observing their behavior. Then the sort of next stronger design would be running experiments where you randomly assign people to conditions and deliver treatments to them. And there are certain things that you can learn by running experiments that you can't learn by doing surveys or just observing people's behavior. And so all of these designs generally involve researchers studying people. And I think what's very exciting about mass collaboration is that we kind of rebalance that dynamic and we say, let's bring these people into the research process. Like, what could we do if instead of studying people, we were collaborating with them? And what kinds of things could we accomplish if we had this collaboration on a massive scale? So I think the best example of what is possible with mass collaboration is Wikipedia. So many of you have used Wikipedia. Everyone, I think, has used Wikipedia. Uh, and it's amazing. And it shows, I think, what is possible when many people from all over the world can work together on something. And if we imagine that now there are so many people in the world with so many special skills who all can be connected together through the internet, what is it that we could all do together? So imagine just take the, the 30 of us in this room. Like imagine if we all did one thing. You all are going to do group projects next week. What if you all did your group project together? I would guess that the 30 of you working together in one week could do something amazing. And what if we had all the partner institutes working together? And what if we had even more people from all over the world? So big things in the world require usually lots of people. And so now we have potentially new ways to have lots of people working together on research projects. So the I think that a lot of the way that I think about mass collaboration is informed by sort of three different streams of research that um, sort of overlap and reinforce each other. So the first is research about crowdsourcing. And crowdsourcing, the main idea is you take a task that's normally done inside of your organization or maybe your research group, and you sort of outsource it to a crowd. There's a second related uh, area of research around what's called citizen science. And citizen science is mainly focused on bringing citizens into the scientific process, as if scientists are not themselves citizens. Um, and then the third thing um, that I think mass collaboration draws from is research about collective intelligence. 
So collective intelligence is largely about how we can organize groups of people to work together to do things that uh, are as if intelligent. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of blend all of those together, and I'm going to refocus them much more on what I think is important for social science research, less about what's important for governments or companies. And so I like to sort of split up this space into three main buckets. Um, there are many ways to divide this space. This is the division that I've come up with that I think is most useful for social research. Um, and so we have sort of three main areas. The first is human computation. So these are things where you have a, a relatively easy task, but you have a very big scale. And so the difficulty comes from the scale, not from the task itself. So a classic example of this is Galaxy Zoo, where they had uh, thousands of volunteers help label galaxies about whether they were spiral or elliptical. So it turns out it's relatively easy to label galaxies. It doesn't, you don't need to be an uh, astronomical researcher. With a little bit of training, everyone here could label these galaxies. Um, but the difficulty comes from the fact that they had uh, close to a million images uh, that needed to be labeled. Uh, so then these are the kinds of problems that in the past researchers might have asked undergraduates to do, let's say. Um, a second kind of problem is what I would call an open call problem. So in this case, the difficulty comes not from the scale, but from the problem itself. And so if you have a problem that's really hard, you might not even know how to solve it, even if you had unlimited amounts of time. And so you can open up this question to many people, and hopefully they can submit a solution to you. This works really well when you have problems that are easy to state and where the solutions are easy to verify. And having solutions that are easy to verify is very, very unusual in social science now. So if you think about when you're asked to review a paper, think how long that takes to decide whether this paper is correct or not correct, doing what it says it's doing or not. And often there's disagreement about whether the paper is doing what it's doing or not. That's an example of something that's not easy to verify. But if I said to you, like, make a battery that uh, can run without recharging for 100 straight hours using this machine, then you can give me that battery, I can put it in the machine, and I can see how long it lasts. So it's easy to verify everyone can agree on whether we've done it or not done it, if we've posed the question correctly. So I think increasingly in social science we'll be able to pose questions in this way so that we can open up and be, take inputs from many, many more people. A classic example of this is the Netflix Prize. Um, the third, may, uh, the Netflix Prize, let me explain what that is. Uh, so many of you may, may be familiar with this already. The Netflix Prize, Netflix wanted to improve their ability to recommend movies to people, and so they released a large amount of data about people's movie ratings and then asked uh, people out in the world who didn't work at Netflix to try to build an algorithm that would be able to predict what ratings people would give to movies. So the task is very clear, predict what ratings people will give to movies. The way that you would achieve this task is not clear. The third main category is uh, what I would call distributed data collection. And this is cases where um, the main role that these participants play is in actually collecting your data for you. So most data collection now in surveys, for example, is a form of distributed data collection. Usually. If you were going to run a large survey, face-to-face -face survey, let's say, you would hire a company, they would hire staff, those staff would go out and interview people, and that's how you would collect your data. Now, there are increasing opportunities for this data collection to be done by volunteers. This introduces a number of other problems about data quality, but there are ways of potentially addressing those problems. And by having large-scale volunteer data collection, you can potentially work at a scale that's much different than what you could do um, by hiring a company. And so a classic example of this is eBird, which is an ornithology project. Uh, so every day there are people out in the world looking at birds as a hobby. That's people like looking at birds. And then they write down what birds they see. And that's part of the culture of birding. And prior to eBird, most of this valuable data about 
bird prevalence was just sitting on notebooks in people's houses. And the people in eBird said, let's make a system where people can upload this data to us, and then this will give us information about especially migration of birds at a global scale. So it's interesting, ornithology has this culture of mass collaboration and citizen science in part because it is impossible to study bird migrations at your own university. So, right, it, many of you can do your research sitting in your office uh, or maybe with students at your university, but that is not possible if you want to study bird migration. You need to have larger scale collaborations. And so they have this um, tradition in their field, which I think is wonderful. So those are the three sort of main buckets, and we'll get, uh, um, I'll give you a lecture about sort of each of these areas and go into more detail about them. So I do want to provide, though, before going into each specific one, provide some sort of overall orienting perspective. So for me, I think it's very important when we talk about mass collaboration to think of these people as collaborators and not as cogs in our machine. So some people, when they think about human computation or putting things on Mechanical Turk, it often uh, treats the other people who are involved as cogs in some big algorithm or process. And I think there's the more exciting stuff to me personally comes from thinking of these people as collaborators. And I think there are great traditions of this in ornithology, as I mentioned, and also astronomy, where there's been a long tradition of citizen science doing observations of different things in the sky. So I'll try to take this collaborator's approach rather than a COGS approach in what I talk about today. One question that sometimes people ask me is, is this really research? Like, if you're designing a system to, to solve a problem, then maybe you're not really solving the problem yourself. All these other people are solving the problem. Is that really research? So to me, the answer to this is, Let's think about whether this enables new research. So if you have a scientific question and there is a process through which you can solve that scientific question, then that is research. It might not look like the research that we're used to seeing where we sit in our office and analyze some data, but the process of so organizing people to solve a problem, of assuming you actually solve the problem and the problem is interesting and important, that I consider to be research. Um, Another question I'm often asked is, is this perfect? And the answer is definitely no, this is not perfect. But I think the better question is, is this better than what we can do without mass collaboration? So for example, when people look at the data from eBird, they say, oh my goodness, there's so many problems with this data. Uh, how could you do this? But there are certain things that you can answer with that data that you could not answer in other ways. And so, rather than focusing on what's perfect, which I think is good to keep in mind, I think we should also keep in mind with what is possible without mass collaboration. And if mass collaboration enables new things, that's important even if it is not yet perfect. Um, is this impossible? Sometimes people think that this is like, some of these things that we'll talk about are very difficult and it's very hard to do, and maybe a lot of these projects fail uh, but I think a better question is, is this possible? So I think Wikipedia is a wonderful example of showing what is possible. And I think scientists haven't spent a lot of time doing their research when this stuff was all possible. So many of the people who, who have done research before us whose ideas we draw on, they were living in a different time with different capabilities. And so the fact that they did not do these things doesn't mean that they were not good ideas. It just means they couldn't do them. They were like literally unable to do them. So I think we are the first scientists who are living in a time where this is technologically possible. And I think also where it's sort of socially understood as being possible. So the idea of user generated content, for example, 10 years ago, that was just a weird idea. And people didn't really feel super comfortable with that. And now it's just like normal. Like to you, all user-generated content is probably just a normal thing that you've lived with your whole lives. But many um, people, that's not a world that they grew up in. And so it feels unusual. So I think we should focus on what is possible. Um, and then to be really clear, I'm going to tell some, provide some examples of what I think are amazing projects. But I think 
also, while I was working on this part of Bit by Bit, I also read about a lot of projects that were failures. So I want to be really clear that I am absolutely only going to tell you about successful projects. I'm not going to tell you about the failures. So most mass collaborations fail. And what that means for you is that you should really um, think of this as like a high risk, potentially high return kind of research activity. And as such, you should design it in that way where, for example, you want to have quickly a proof of concept before you start investing a lot in custom software development and so on. So you can think of it kind of like a startup. And if it's not going to work, you want to find out very quickly that it's not going to work rather than invest a year in creating some infrastructure that turns out people aren't going to be excited about. OK? Any questions about mass collaboration? Any questions from the live stream? OK, we'll move to the next uh, section. So um, now we're going to, so I talked about splitting up the field into these three main areas. Now we're going to talk about one of those main areas, human computation. So these are for things where there is an easy task that you could do yourself if you had enough time, but the task is so big that you can't do all of it. Um, these are tasks also where humans are generally better than computers. So I want to be clear about what I mean here. So if you have an easy task, big scale problem, that's generally a good thing to give to a computer. right? So adding up a bunch of numbers, that's very easy. For you, you could do it. The difficulty comes from the scale, and so you ask a computer to do it. And so although there are many things that um, computers are very good at, and uh, there are still some things that humans are better than computers. And so these are the kinds of problems um, for which I think these human computation tasks are helpful. Uh, someone asked me, what are the problems where humans are better than computers? And I don't, I think that that frontier is increasingly changing. And so I will not go out on a limb and say what I think, where that boundary will be in the future. Um, but uh, there are going to be some of these tasks, uh, particularly when it involves extracting sort of subtle human-specific meaning. I think, at least for a little while, humans will be better at it. And there are also very interesting ways that we can combine human effort and computer effort through a supervised learning process. Um, as I said here, I think increasingly, if you are going to have humans involved in these tasks, uh, rather than having the humans do all the work, I think a natural way to think about it is have the humans do enough work that they can train a computer how to do the work, and then have the computer do the work. So you can see this transition in Galaxy Zoo. So in the first iteration of Galaxy Zoo, they had the humans label all of the images. Then they said, this is not a good use of human effort. Let's have the humans label a bunch of the images, and then we'll train a supervised learning model to be able to accomplish this task. And then we'll be able to label as many images as we want. And so this is increasingly important in the astronomical setting because the amount of images that are being created in these new um, high throughput telescopes is increasing very, very, very rapidly. I don't know the exact numbers, but you could imagine like the amount of data increases by a factor of 10 every couple of years. I don't know the exact numbers, but something kind of like that. Uh, and so then like the people at Galaxy Zoo said, we can't get 10 times more volunteers every couple of years. That's just not possible. And so we have to think about better ways of combining human effort and machine effort. Um, and I think that these kind of human computation tasks will become increasingly important in social research as we move away from rectangular survey data to data that uses image, uh, images, text, videos, and so on, sound. So a lot of these things, the meaning of them is potentially difficult to extract for a machine, but is much easier for humans. And so I think these are the types of data where we will see human computation uh, in the social research. Um, so just to give an example of a paper that does this um, using text data, 
Uh, and also, uh, there's a couple things I really love about this paper, so I'm going to get to those in a second. But this is a paper by some uh, political scientists about crowdsourcing text analysis. So what they say in the abstract is um, empirical social science often relies on data that are not observed in the field but are transformed into quantitative variables by expert researchers who analyze and interpret qualitative raw sources. So this would be things like images, text, videos, audio. Um, while generally considered the most valid way to produce data, the expert-driven process is inherently difficult to replicate or to assess on the grounds of reliability. Using crowdsourcing to distribute text for reading and interpretation by massive numbers of non-experts, we generate results comparable to those using experts to read and interpret the same text, but do so far more quickly and flexibly, uh, and also in a way that's easier to reproduce. So here's an example of the kind of text that they use. So these are uh, political party manifestos. So I'm not a political scientist, but my understanding is that uh, many political parties produce a document that sort of says what they're excited about. Um, and you might want to know what's in those documents. So if you're a political scientist, you might study the themes that are in those documents and how those vary over time and how those differ across countries and so on. So here's one from the Labor Party in the UK in 2010. Millions of people working in our public services embody the best values of Britain, helping empower people to make the most of their lives while protecting them from the risks they should not have to bear on their own. Just as we need to be bolder about the role of government in making markets work fairly, we also need to be bold reformers of government. Okay. So that's an example of what it, these documents are often like. Um, and then they wanted to code these sentences. Um, and so they wanted to code whether they were about um, economic policy, social policy, or neither economic nor social policy. And then if they were about economic policy, they wanted to code whether they were very left, somewhat left, neither left or right, somewhat right, or very right. And likewise, if they were social policy, they wanted to also label them on this five-point scale. So they sent these out through a crowdsourcing service similar to Mechanical Turk, which also had speakers of many different languages, because many of these documents are not written in English. They're written in the languages of the, the countries where they're created. Uh, so this is results from uh, the UK. So here are the expert coding estimates. And here are the estimates that come from the crowd. And so the different um, numbers here illustrate the different years. And the colors indicate the different political parties. But what I want you to focus on is how these two things line up very well. So the results from the crowd are very similar to the estimates that come from experts on both economic policy and social policy. So I've left out one step here that I would encourage you to read about in the paper. They did not do a simple aggregation of what the people in the crowd said. They did a number of other steps to combine the feedback they get from the crowd. They did it through a statistical model to help deal with some of the noisiness that comes from these non-expert ratings. Um, so this suggests that this is possible to do through non-experts. They can produce results that are comparable to experts. But what I really love about this paper is they focus on this data being better and not cheaper. And so they focus on it being better in the sense, this process being better and not cheaper, and they focus on it being better in the sense that you can actually, as new political issues become salient, you can go back and recode old manifestos by using a crowd service in a way that you can't with the experts. So they can't reconvene this group of experts from 1992 to code about immigration even though immigration is increasingly an important issue in Europe. So with this crowd service, actually very easy to do. The other thing that they emphasize about being better is that this process is reproducible. So they, in their paper, they code these documents, and then like six months later, they recode the documents, and they get very similar results. And then we could go and code the documents today, and we might get similar results. We might not, but we might. Uh, and so, Emphasizing having these non-experts involved as a way of increasing reproducibility is, again, focusing on something that is a scientific improvement, not just a decrease in cost, 
So in other words, they try to really make the point that experts are a bug and not a feature. And so I think increasingly when you have tasks that you see in your research that are being done by experts, there may be a good reason for that. Like I would not want volunteers to do surgery on me, for example. Um, but take a minute and think, like, are experts really a bug here or are they a feature? What kinds of things would be possible if we could have this task being done by non-experts? Okay, any questions about human computation? Natalie? Mm -hmm. reading all these manifestos that could very reasonably end up with different ratings. I mm -hmm. mean, that's something that psychology studies. And so what are they putting in the statistical model that like makes it perfect? Like, yes. how does that work? Yes, so I think, so the question is about sort of maybe accuracy of the responses that you get and the process of aggregating potentially noisy responses. Yeah, I think biasing. I mean, in psychology, the argument would be if it's the experts, at least you know whose biases you're dealing with. And if mm -hmm. it's crowdsourced, you're introducing maybe randomly distributed biases, but maybe not. Well, so yeah. So one of the things that the models that they do have do is they average a bunch of ratings. So a lot of, uh, if there's random noise, and if that is random and unstructured, then having lots of people rate the same thing, you can shrink that down. And so their, argu their modeling depends a lot on that. And then the other thing is they model it, um, let's see, how do I explain this? So they're also able to potentially pull out uh, participants who seem to be giving crazy answers. So essentially, if you have, not crazy, let me clarify, answers that seem to be different than everyone else's answers. Maybe everyone is crazy. but. Uh, Basically, if you have a whole data matrix of, if you have multiple responses per rater, and those, a given rater seems to be very different than what everyone else is doing, you can potentially downweight that person. But I think there are legitimate questions. It, that, that's kind of how the model works. I think there are legitimate questions, though, about if everyone has the same kind of bias, then that's obviously not going to get removed by averaging. Um, and for tasks that are more subjective. So in the social science, it, so Galaxy Zoo is the one that I talked about a lot with you know, spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies and you know, Democrats and Republicans and labor voters and Tory voters probably don't see those stars very differently. Um, as we talk about these social things though, it, it becomes increasingly potentially sensitive to who the raters are. And so then I think we can potentially use some of the techniques we learned about um, for surveys, where we try to think about who is actually participating and at least assess to what extent they seem to be similar to or different from the people we'd like to learn about. But then it involves being sort of more clear that there isn't so much a ground truth uh, anymore and that we want to sort of understand the variability. So another thing you could potentially do with this that you could not do with the experts is to say, what are the sentences that people disagree about the most? Yeah. That might actually be interesting. So another way of thinking of multiple raters with different perspectives as a feature and not a bug. Other questions? Tina? I'm just curious, so with like more mass collaboration projects happening and you know, as they get more successful over time, do you think this requires a shift in our thinking of authorship and what counts as like contributions? Yes, absolutely. Um, so this uh, goes back to thinking of people as collaborators and not cogs. And so I think um, we have, in science we have a way, a mechanism for giving people who contribute to a piece of research credit, and that's co-authorship. And so I think we will increasingly have to decide to what extent uh, participating in a mass collaboration is something that we acknowledge through co-authorship or we acknowledge through other mechanisms. Um, we also have mechanisms like prizes. Um, this is another thing that things that you can put on your CV are generally ways of rewarding people for doing stuff that we think is important for science. And so I think these are things that we're all going to have to 
resolve. Okay. So any other questions? Any questions from the live stream? Okay, so now we are going to take a break. Is that right? We are maybe going to, we're going to do another chunk. All right, we're going to do another chunk, and then we're going to take a break. Open call. We're going to do open call. Then we're going to take a short break. Um, and then, uh, so let's talk a little bit about open calls. So remember, there are three main types of mass collaboration projects that I talked about. Um, the first that we just talked about was human computation. There you have an easy task and a big scale. Here with open calls, you have a different problem. You might not even yourself know how to solve this problem, but you imagine that someone else might know how to solve it. So this is a kind of task, rather than giving this task to an undergraduate, you might try to go and talk to one of your colleagues about. So this book, how many of you have read this book, Longitude, by Davia Sobel? No? Oh, this is such a good book. OK, I, t I totally recommend this book. It's an example of one of the first open calls. Um, it was from the UK in the 1700s, I think, a long time ago. Uh, and they uh, had this problem that they wanted to know how to measure the longitude of a ship at sea. And this was a very important problem for the United Kingdom because it had military importance that warships needed to know where they were and where they were going. And also for commerce, ships were sort of just getting lost at sea. And so they wanted to, the government needed a solution to this problem. They opened it up. Many people thought the solution would be an astronomical solution, that by looking at the stars, you would sort of be able to figure out uh, what your longitude was at sea. That was the main focus of a lot of the research at the time. And it turned out that the solution that ended up being the most successful was a solution that involved actually having a very accurate timepiece that could work on a boat. And so by measuring, now we're way, this is like, I'm not an oceanographer or, or um, navigator of a boat. But something about you can see what, where you are when the sun is directly overhead. And then if you have this clock correctly, you can figure out what your longitude is. So the solution in this case, the point of this story um, is that this is a great book. And also that the solution to problems may come in unexpected places and in unexpected ways. And if you can have a problem where it's clear what you want to do, you can be open to novel and unexpected solutions like a clock. Um, so here you need to be working with problems where solutions are easier to check than they are to generate. And there are um, certain problems like this. So this comes up actually some in cryptography. So if I give you two very big prime, uh, so if I give you a very big number and I tell you find the prime factors of this number, that's very hard. But if you give me two big prime numbers, I can multiply them together and see whether that equals the bigger number. It's very easy to check. It's very hard to uh, actually generate the solution. And there are lots of, we, generally social researchers don't think about problems like this, but I think there are problems like this. And to the extent that we can formulate our problems like this, we can be open to these unexpected solutions. Um, one beautiful thing about this is that the standards then are not about interestingness, let's say. They're about whether you can actually do the thing that solved the problem, right? So can you build a battery that will run this machine for 100 hours? Then it doesn't matter if you can get up and give a wonderful talk and get everyone very excited about your work. It just matters whether you can actually do the thing that's important. So I think that to the extent that social science is focused on interestingness, then this, we've all been at talks where people can give an amazing talk. It's like, wow, that was really fascinating. That was interesting. It was such an unexpected result. And then afterwards, you're like, mm, I don't know that that actually really solved any problem. It's just a beautiful talk, right? And so I think that. Um, 
these open call problems have us give us an opportunity to move away from this high charisma social science to a social science based on actually doing stuff. Um, the other great thing about these open calls to me is that they actually allow you to show that you are making progress. So social scientists have been doing research about many things for a long time. I think we've actually learned a lot. But imagine trying to talk to a congressperson. And congressperson says, I'm really interested in education, let's say. And you say, well, social scientists have been doing lots of research about education. The congressman says, OK, well, have you solved any problems? And you would say, well, we have many journal articles that are excellent. Uh, and they'd be like, okay, well, have you solved any problems? And it's true that we've learned a lot, but it's very difficult for us to demonstrate that learning to other people. So compare it to, for example, the DARPA challenge with self-driving cars. So they set up this challenge and they said, okay, you have to drive, you have to have your car drive itself through this obstacle course. And the first year, most of the cars didn't make it. And then the next year, more cars got further. And the next year, more cars got further. And there was actual demonstrable progress. And so if there are very clear goals that are easy to verify, then we have the possibility of making progress. Uh, one, I actually have created an open call research project, which you all are going to participate in in a few hours. Um, and one of the questions that comes up about that project, which is called the Fragile Families Challenge, is, is this really research? Like, some people said, Matt, you're not really doing anything. Like, you're not actually building these machine learning models. Um, and the way I think about it is, like, are we actually trying to make progress on a problem? And if this effort leads to progress on a problem, then it is research, even if it doesn't look like what people normally think of as research. Um, OK? Any questions about open call projects? I didn't give an example because we're going to have an extended example uh, in a few minutes, and you all are going to get a chance to participate in it. Yeah, Catherine? So I was kind of wondering about this charisma-free social science concept, because I think at least in machine learning, I see a great pressure when we apply machine learning algorithms to social problems to come up with some sort of explanation of what's happening. And often people prefer an inferior algorithm that's intuitively understandable to one that works well. And in your experience you know, running these projects yourself, what do you think about the trade-off between you know, making progress on knowledge by being able to explain something versus just being able to predict something effectively? Mm, OK, well, this will definitely come up much more when we talk about the Fragile Families Challenge in detail. Um, I think that. Um, Interpretability is not, I would not associate interpretability with charisma. I would say interpretability is potentially very important for thinking about robustness and stability of these machine learning models. So if you build a machine learning model that makes certain predictions, and if those predictions don't seem to make any sense, given our understanding of the world, then I'm less confident that those predictions will work well in a completely new data set. Um, and I'm less confident that they will work well six months from now or a year from now. So I think the desire to have something that's understandable um, is potentially related to thinking really about performance if we generalize what performance means. Uh, I also think that for certain high stakes decisions, the desire to have something that's interpretable is very natural. So for example, if you go to the, this is an example I've heard, imagine you go to the doctor, the doctor says, okay, I'm going to do surgery on you tomorrow. We have to do surgery right away. And you're like, well, why? And the doctor says, well, this is what the algorithm says. Right? That is not, I mean, that, you, right, you can make all the argument, oh, that algorithm is correct. It's been well validated and so on. But like, for certain things, if you can't actually explain it to people for high stakes decisions, I think there are potential concerns. And finally, I will add a third thing, which is that the new GDPR, the new sort of European data protection standards, I believe they have in them a requirement for explainability for certain high stakes decisions. And so the desire for interpretability also in that case is driven by law. 
So I think there are a lot of reasons that we might be concerned about interpretability because it's actually important for performance in a more general sense, uh, because it's important for people to have confidence in what you're doing, and it's potentially the law. Other questions? Thanks. Um, a lot of social science isn't often formulated in this, like, I've got a goal, how do I accomplish it sort of style. It's more uh, basic research, I guess you'd say, if it were hard science. Um, and I wonder if you have thoughts about how to convert or reframe questions that are you know, common in social science into this sort of tangible goal outcome. I mean, you, Federal Families Challenge is one example, yeah. but, but other sorts of things in that vein. Yep. You know, how do we get them to look like this? And are there things that we don't want to look like this? OK, so I'll, the first question, how do we get things to look like this? So I'll give um, another example that I uh, actually was just thinking about yesterday with your um, survey activity. So one way to do it, let's imagine we were studying um, questionnaire effects in surveys. And so the way that it's often done now is people come up with these effects and do studies of them. And so another way would see, OK, we're interested in question order effects. So we're going to open it up, and anyone we want you to find the pair of questions that has the biggest possible question order effect. Everyone can submit their questions, and we'll run 100 of these questions on a survey, and we'll see the size of the question effects on all of these. And so what might come out of that, um, we might have a much different understanding of question order effects if we try to think about sort of maximizing them. So I think anything that can be turned into a maximization where there is a clear metric, then you can start to see who can do the most on that metric. Now, what are the kinds of things where we don't want to do this? Uh, that is a great question. I don't know the answer. Um, but I would say, um, I guess I would frame it a little differently. Maybe I'd say, like, it, a lot of like theory building and understanding is not easy to come through this process of maximizing some metric. But potentially trying to maximize that metric leads to more theory building. So I don't think often, so in the Fragile Families Challenge, which we'll do in a minute, some people say, we don't really care about this predictive task. And I could say, I understand that. I can see why people might not care about it. But in the process of doing this predictive task, we actually have to solve a lot of other problems that you probably do care about. Like we have to improve measurement. We have to improve metadata for the survey. Uh, we have to build better theory about what things are important. And so I think we wouldn't want all research to be like these competitions to move some metric. Um, but that can be a part of doing the other kinds of things that we're currently doing. Is a question from the live stream? Yes, this is from Helsinki, um, Finland. So moving from charisma to something we can measure sounds to me like money ball for science. Is that a good development, or does that direct our focus and ideas of science towards um, something that we want to have? It's a great question. Um, I never thought of it that way. Um, and a baseball question from Helsinki, too. That's really cool. Um, so I definitely think there is a possibility that this could, assuming everything turned into a metrics-driven competition, I think that would likely be bad for social science. But I think we are nowhere near that point. Uh, and so I guess if I was going to advocate for something, I would advocate for a few more of these. And then we can be a little bit more clear about what is gained and what is lost. Um, but I think we're nowhere near kind of overshooting the mark. I'm not worried about that yet. Is question? So, is that working? OK. And so in thinking about these three types of mass collaboration, it seems to me that like open call is like set aside from the other two in terms of um, as like an early career researcher. Do you think that um, open calls make sense? Or, do, or is, am I thinking of? Am I maybe limiting the possibilities to say that that's yeah. the case? OK, so I think there's two questions about 
there's two questions there. One is about organizing an open call, and the other is about participating in an open call. So I think organizing an open call um, as an early career researcher could be difficult um, because it can be difficult to create something that people want to participate in. Uh, and that is, so I think there's a real chance that if you wanted to create an open call, people might not end up participating and then you've spent a lot of time on something that didn't lead to something. That, that's a real concern. Participating in open calls, I think if they're well organized, um, there's no reason that you wouldn't want to participate in an open call as an early career researcher. So if they're organized in a way that acknowledges the contributions of people, then participating in them can be great. So for example, in the Fragile Families Challenge, we had prizes. Um, the people who did really well got, we have a prize winner here. Amen, hi. Uh, so um, they were able to you know, put this on their CV. We also had opportunities for people to publish, both collectively. So we had one, we are, we are working on one paper where everyone who makes a meaningful contribution will be a co-author. We also have another opportunity. We have a special issue of a journal. And everyone who wants to submit a paper about what they did can submit to that. And so there are multiple opportunities for people who make meaningful contributions to be recognized for those in the way that scientists are usually recognized for their contribution. So that was a big part of how we designed the challenge. And I think if they're well designed, there's no reason not to participate. And, and I just add one thing, and they're kind of fun, and you learn a lot of new stuff. So I think that by doing them and comparing how what you do, it works compared to what other people do, it's a great opportunity for learning. And I think we are now out of time, and we're going to have a coffee break. And we will meet back here in a few minutes. Oh, right? We're going to do another one? <laughs> All right. When do we have our coffee break? Oh, good. OK. We're going to do another one. Um, see, I really wanted to leave more time for breaks. and I. Anyway, OK. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do distributed data collection, and then we're going to have a coffee break. And then we're going to do the Fragile Families Challenge. OK. So distributed data collection. So this is the third main area. So first, we had uh, these human computation problems that were easy task, big scale. Then we talked about open call problems, where the difficulty comes from not even knowing how to approach the problem. And so you want to be open to many new ideas, especially this is especially useful if the problem has solutions that are easy to check. Uh, distributed data collection is a third area that involves sort of allowing people to bring in new measurements to you. So one way of thinking about the difference between, sometimes people ask human computation and distributed data collection, how are they different? So for example, if someone is adding labels to an image, you could call that data collection as well. So the way I like to think about it differently is distributed data collection involves not people annotating data to existing measurements that you have, but providing new measurements. And this having people provide new measurements about the world introduces a number of different problems that can arise. Um, so I think a lot of opportunities for distributed data collection come where people can be where researchers can't. So some of these challenges are logistical, like you can't be everywhere. Some of them are really, people can be where it's not safe for you to be. There are a lot of other times where there are settings where you just can't be where you need to be to collect the data. And you can't necessarily hire someone to be where you need to be to collect the data. Um, it potentially offers a scale that researchers can't match if you have people all over the world working together on this, like eBird. Um, and as I said, it's sometimes hard to separate from human computation, but I think the big difference is the new measurements from the world, particularly in a setting where people can be where researchers can't. Okay? So I want to give one, one look, people, when they hear about distributed data collection, their first thought, if they're a social scientist, is always data quality. Right? How can this be possible? This is going to be garbage. 
That is a very good first reaction. Uh, but now I want to give you an example of a project that uses technology in a way that um, gives us more confidence in the quality of the data and also standardizes the data collection some. So we had a question earlier about if we have people t uh, labeling texts, how do we know if there's some sort of potential liberal or conservative bias in the way they do those labels? So imagine now if instead the data collection is done through a, through a piece of technology where those concerns don't become so important. So who is exactly contributing is less important than what they're contributing. And uh, this is an example called Photo City. Um, so the one way to think about where this project came from is there was an earlier project that was called Building Rome in a Day. And so they had this cool idea that there are all these pictures online. And so what if we take all these pictures that people post online and use them to recreate 3D images of Rome? So they tried to get all the images of Rome they could find online and then put them all together to recreate these 3D models. And so here you can see a reconstruction of the Colosseum and these are the angles that the pictures are being taken from. So one of the things they found is that many people who are taking pictures of the Colosseum turn out to all take the same picture. It's like, same angle, same. So the, if you want to create a 3D reconstruction, you need to have some way of getting people to take pictures of other parts of the building. And so what they did is they started this project called Photo City, where they tried to reconstruct buildings on the campuses of the University of Washington and Cornell. And so they set this up as a game where they had these flags on the different buildings. And you could go and take pictures and win flags. And there's teams and points. And so a bunch of in trying to make the data collection and participation enjoyable. Um, and then people would upload pictures. And these are the results of the reconstruction. So I want to talk a little bit about how the structure of this enables a lot of confidence about the quality of the data and how I think that will become increasingly possible. So the way these reconstructions work is the, um, the researchers uploaded a very small number of seed images of each building. And then the pictures that participants contributed were matched against those pre-existing seed images. And if they didn't match, they were rejected. So you can see how redundancy enables you to assess data quality. So they put in a small amount of data that they knew was true. And then they're able to use redundancy and overlap as a way of ensuring data quality. So you don't need to just totally trust what everyone is doing. Redundancy can be your friend to assess data quality. The second thing about this is that because people were contributing images, all of the data was standardized in the sense of it didn't matter if you were in, in eBird, for example, there are big questions about um, variation in uh, participant quality in the sense of some people are really good at separating like a bald eagle from like a redheaded hawk or something. And like, I'm not good at that. And so like, I could be uploaded like that bird right there. I could upload that to eBird as like a crow, and it might not be a crow. Um, but if I was just taking a picture of it and uploading it, then that de-skills the process of contribution. And so here, what they've done by having people use these cameras is they've de-skilled it. And so anyone with a camera um, is able to participate. And now, many people have cameras on their smartphones. So many, many people could participate in a project like this. So it's a beautiful design that solves lots of problems. Uh, as I said, the standardizing the data collection means de-skilling, which increases the number of people that can participate. Um, the verification is automatic by comparing to nearby images. And the other thing I love about this is that they help people contribute more valuable information using the scoring system they have. So the number of points that you get for your picture is related to the number of pixels that it adds to the reconstruction. 
And so over time, they're teaching the respondents how to contribute better and better data. And so eBird does this as well, where they train people about what different birds are. And if you upload something like, I just saw a bald eagle on Duke's campus, they will potentially send you a message saying, we think it's unlikely that you saw a bald eagle on Duke's <laughs> campus. So they are trying to like uh, upskill the participants. And I think here, the scoring mechanism does a great job of doing that so that people can contribute as much information as possible. You're helping them contribute important information. So any questions about distributed data collection? So I can, I can see that you're able to download data from eBird. Do they have data on like how many like moments there are when someone says that's a bald eagle and it's a crow or something? Yes, okay, so let me talk a little bit about eBird, the data verification process, and then the analysis process. Because eBird has a problem that I think many distributed data collection systems will have that you need to be aware of. Okay, um, so first, as soon as something is uploaded to eBird, uh, it gets compared against a database of sort of historical known sightings. So if you say that you see a bald eagle here, it will say that seems unlikely, and it will send it right away to an editor, a volunteer editor who's an, a local expert. Another problem is that people sometimes say they see things out of season, so like, I don't know what kind of birds are usually here in the summer, but the birds that are here in the summer are potentially different than the birds that are here in the winter. And so there's enough historical data that you can create a flagging system. Those things get sent to a local volunteer who then goes back and forth with the person who made the submission. Um, this is a very important process though because one of the things they're interested in is changing migration patterns. And so let's say a bird that used, is usually here in the summer shows up here in March. So is that like an outlier, or is that incredibly important information about changing migration patterns? And so having these local experts involved is very important. Um, so then the data gets in there, and then there's another problem, which is that if you look at eBird, almost all of the birds in the US are near roads. So there are no birds where there are no roads in eBird. Uh, and this is because these bird sightings are done by people, and so they are mostly near places where people can go. And there are certain parts of the US that are hard to get to, and we don't have any good measurements of birds there. And so there are a number of ways that you can try to deal with this. So they have built different kind of statistical models to try to adjust for this. It's a huge problem. Uh, anytime you have people contributing data, through a distributed data collection, you have to realize that it's gonna be limited by where the people are. Um, another problem they have is that different people do birding in different ways. So some people only write down like whether they've seen a bird. Like, have you seen a bald eagle on your walk today? But they don't write down how many bald eagles they've seen. And so they want to encourage people to count, do exact counts, not just I saw one or I didn't see one. Also, it turns out people, some birders tend to only report the exciting birds that they've seen. And so like where I live, there's tons and tons of geese. So if I was out doing bird, I'd be like getting exhausted and writing down every single goose that I saw. And so they try really hard to encourage people to also report on the species that are very common because obviously that creates, um, it's important for the data as well. So there are a number of things that data quality issues that can arise. They have a bunch of mechanisms for dealing with them. Um, and then they have a bunch of statistical models to try to correct for the problems that, that exist in the data collection. Um, I should also say that eBird is a system that has been running for many, many years now. It has many, many researchers involved. It's a huge project. And so if you start a distributed data collection, it's not going to have all of those safeguards initially. Right, so this is all stuff that they've sort of developed over time. So don't expect your distributed data collection to have all of that infrastructure at the beginning. Um, another thing about eBird that I think is really nice is that they take advantage of stuff that people are doing anyway. 
This is a, so in Photo City, they really tried to encourage people to do something they wouldn't have done already, take these pictures of buildings and upload them. eBird is able to take advantage of stuff that people are already doing and enjoying. And so to the extent that there's stuff that people are already doing that is creating meaningful data, that makes your distributed data collection process easier. So uh, I think one way to validate this data is to have an expert check each piece of data. So in the case of um, reconstructing Rome, um, the, the true images act as uh, experts. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that case, it works out because uh, you can take images from different directions and make sure that uh, you have images from all different directions so that every image that's uploaded has an overlap, mm -hmm. the true image. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if we're going to take expert validation as one way to uh, make sure that the data, uh, the quality of the data, how is it possible that uh, uh, can, is it possible that every task can be uh, divided into small pieces that can be validated by an expert without the expert actually checking each individual data set that's uploaded online individually? Yeah. So I think it's a good question about. So one way to ensure accuracy that I talked about is redundancy between non-experts. And another way is to have experts doing spot checking or more systematic checking in the way that they do in eBird. So I think that is, let's say that you believe that your distributed data collection system is producing high quality data and other people might not believe it. And so then I think doing a sample where you have experts check a sample of the data is potentially a powerful technique to, one, convince yourself, and two, to convey that to others. So what's the right role for experts in checking and distributed data collection? I think that's an open problem, but I think that is an, another good way of ensuring quality. Is this work? Yeah. I was wondering about like the ethics of this, if you do it in a social science application, like making regular people go out into the world and report on each other and observe like social behavior? That's a great question. Um, so a couple of things. One is we're not making anyone do anything. I wouldn't recommend making anyone do anything. Uh, what you're doing is creating a way for people to participate if they want. Now, the examples that we've talked about so far are eBird is reporting on birds. This photo city is taking pictures of buildings. So in social science, you may want to have people collecting data about other people. This does raise questions uh, about consent, for example. So you may, the people who are reporting the data are consenting to participate. The people they are reporting about are not consenting to participate. Um, I think this would have to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but I think you definitely don't want to have a system where people are out and spying on each other in a massive way. So I think that's important. Uh, in the section about designing mass collaborations, uh, I talk some about how we can be, we want to be ethical when we design our mass collaborations to our participants and to our non-participants. So I think in general, we all want to be ethical. Um, but there, when we do mass collaboration, there are a number of issues that arise that are a little bit different. And so I think we should definitely think about the ethics of these things um, carefully as we're creating them. Yeah, David? Can you talk a little bit about the people who choose to participate in these talks? So um, with eBirds, this is probably not such an issue, but uh, there are cities, for example, that you have a smartphone app that mm -hmm. you can report potholes and other things, and then the city government is blocked by fixing it. But when you look at who the people are who report these things, it tends to be affluent neighborhoods. Uh, and so that can actually Yes, absolutely. So if you're going to have a distributed data collection looking for, let's say, potholes, uh, and if the people who report are different than the people who don't report, you're going to get a distorted view of um, what's happening in the city. And then if you, as a decision maker or a policy maker, are not aware of that, then this will introduce problems. Now, I will say that there is, in, in that particular case, there is a way around it. Um, which is that people have built pothole detecting machines that you can add to a car. So if you go over a pothole, it creates like a particular signature of the movement of this box. 
And so they have then attached these boxes to a bunch of city vehicles uh, that drive all over the city. And so then they can mitigate this problem. So in other words, moving stuff from active human participation is potentially subject to these kinds of participatory biases. If the data collection can become more passive, as in just put this box on this city car and enough cars cover the city, uh, then you can potentially mitigate some of these. So I think moving more to passive versus active will help us mitigate some of the participation biases. OK, we are overdue for a break. I just wanted to. Now we're really having a coffee break. <laughs> yeah. uh, and after the coffee break, come back, and we'll do the Fragile Families Challenge. And, and if we could, can we cut the live stream or, or no? Uh, can we easily turn it back on, or is it? Oh, let's just leave it on. That's fine. All right, we'll see all you back. Yeah, we'll see you all back in a few minutes for the Fragile Families Challenge.